Today we are going to start a CNS Physiology Revision Series. So first we are going to start with neurotransmitters. So the first neurotransmitter which is found is acetylcholine. So this is mainly discovered by a scientist uh, called Otto Loewy. So his earlier also uh, this uh, acetylcholine is earlier also known as Vegas Stoff. So before it is called as Vegas stuff, now it is discovered as acetylcholine. So acetylcholine is the first neurotransmitter which is found by Otto Loewy. <coughs> Let us see the classification of neurotransmitters. So mainly we have four classes of neurotransmitters. The first class is acetylcholine and the second class of course first it's formed. So first acetylcholine and the second one is all the biogenic amines. So the amines are like norepinephrine dopamine in the name itself you can say dopamine a minus in the word serotonin and histamine so for dopamine and histamine you can find the word but this norepinephrine serotonin also belong to this biogenic amines so norepinephrine dopamine serotonin histamine and it's coming to class 3 class 3 type of neurotransmitters are mainly amino acids uh, either they can be divided into excitatory and inhibitory like the amino acids which are excitatory are mainly glutamate and aspartase whereas inhibitory neurotransmitters are GABA and glycine. Next class 4 neurotransmitters are ATP and nitric oxide so these are newly uh, found class 4 neurotransmitters. <coughs> Now next let us see the criteria for neurotransmitters. So mainly the synthesis and storage is done at the level of presynaptic area. So we know about the synapse right. We have a presynaptic area, we have a postsynaptic area. So that synthesis and storage of all these neurotransmitters takes place at presynaptic area. And the signals to be released into the synapse are the next of course the signals are uh, released to the synapse and later there also should be receptors uh, for the neurotransmitter especially on the postsynaptic area so that only the signals which are coming from the presynaptic area can be conveyed to the postsynaptic area so <coughs> First let us see about our class 1 and the first uh, neurotransmitter that is acetylcholine. So acetylcholine is a neurotransmitter of neuromuscular junction and it is associated with muscle contraction and acetylcholine is mainly produced by nucleus basalis uh, of Maynard. So remember acetylcholine is produced from nucleus basalis of Maynard and its uh, basal forebrain complex which is mainly associated with memory so from that part our acetylcholine is getting released and acetylcholine also induces REM sleep and also acetylcholine is a neurotransmitter for sweat glands especially by sympathetic sympathetic cholinergic innovation so these are very important points of acetylcholine and the acetylcholine release mainly occurs by a process called as exocytosis because you know these are all like uh, chemical you know actually the uh, the synapses are divided into electrical and chemical synapses in electrical synapses usually we will have the gap junctions whereas these are the chemical synapses so here we will have the vesicles formed in the presynaptic area and they will get out whenever the calcium or positively charged ion is getting inside <coughs> and mainly by exocytosis via help of special SNAR proteins known as synaptobravin and also degradation of synaptobravin by botulinum toxin so mainly synaptobravin is useful here and it can be degraded by botulinum toxin and this leads to flaccid paralysis of course if this is not going to happen then the muscle contraction may not take place and lead to flaccid paralysis so the treatment for this is botox so botox is mainly in, uh, is given in blephas spasm and also in ecclesia cardia as a treatment so that we can prevent the flaccid paralysis next let us go on to the biogenic amines so mainly we have norepinephrine which is formed from dopamine but enzyme dopamine beta hydroxylase so in the presence of enzyme dopamine beta hydroxylase the dopamine is converted into <coughs> norepinephrine next location <coughs> mainly this norepinephrine is located in locus corylus there is a dorsal part of a uh, rostral pons and norepinephrine activates widespread of brain areas and it's a neurotransmitter mainly for arousal and awake state next we'll move on to dopamine dopamine is important role in mainly three pathways those are the nigrostriatal pathway the mesocortical pathway and the tubero infundibular pathway so let us check out each of the pathway of dopamine so the first pathway is nigrostriatal pathway 
Dopamine mainly causes facilitation of voluntary motor movements. Its deficiency will lead to Parkinson's disease, of course, because it leads to motor movements. So, if uh, no no dopamine, then it will lead to Parkinson's disease. That is a passivity of movements, especially bloody kinesia. <laughs> Next, we'll see the mesocortical pathway. Its ventral tegment area. The location is in the ventral tegment area. The dopamine mainly acts as a neutral neural transmitter of reward of reward. And nucleus accumbens is dopamine where it acts as a neurotransmitter of addiction. So, addiction of substances mainly uh, due to activation of dopamine release from nucleus accumbens. And next, coming to tubero infundibular pathway. So here the dopamine inhibits the prolactin. So this one we already seen from in our endocrine physiology, especially from anterior pituitary. Dopamine inhibits the prolactin. Now let us see for the action of this dopamine. It should have some receptors, right? So it has mainly five receptors named D1, D2, D3, D4, D5. So all are G protein couple receptors. We know them. The second messenger system. So serotonin or 5-hydroxy tryptamine is a major inhibitory neurotransmitter. It's a neurotransmitter of arousal or awake state and the location is mainly raphe nucleus. So in platelets we can find higher concentration of serotonin and even in the GIT we can find. So even serotonin should have receptors right. So these receptors are named from serotonin 1 to serotonin 7 and all are these are also all GPR couple receptor, G protein couple receptor except serotonin 3 which is actually ion channel very important exception exception serotonin 3 ion channel now let us see the functions of each of this uh, serotonin receptor so serotonin 2a is mainly a platelet aggregation useful in platelet aggregation and serotonin 2c decrease the food intake that is satiety and serotonin 3 useful in vomiting it's, it's there in vomiting and um, serotonin 4 is for peristalsis in the GIT and remember serotonin is actually a major inhibitory neurotransmitter next move on to histamine so histamine one of the biogenic amine it's important neurotransmitter especially for posterior pituitary so it's also a neurotransmitter of arousal or awake state and mainly it has H2 receptors which increase acid secretions and mainly found in stomach so histamine blockers uh, like <coughs> have a side effect of sedation means our brain capacity is lower so how let us see <coughs> next uh, amino acid neurotransmitters excitatory neurotransmitters mainly glutamate glutamate receptors are abundant in hippocampus which is associated with memory and we have mainly two types of receptors like this AMPA receptor and NMDA receptor so AMPA receptor is always associated with sodium channel whereas NMDA is associated with calcium channel and the function is conversion of short term memory to long term memory because you can see glutamate is having its receptors in memory region so it converts the short term memory to long term memory and the location is subthalamic nucleus of basal ganglia where the glutamate is excitatory neurotransmitter. <coughs> Now let us see the inhibitory neurotransmitters. So we have the first one GABA. GABA main function is inhibitory function by causing hyperpolarization by regulating chloride ion channel. So actually what GABA does it, it increases the chlorine influx. So because of that the cell becomes hyperpolarized because of negatively charged and it becomes inhibitory. So we have some GABA agonists that are like similar to GABA which inhibit. So these are like causing sedation especially we have barbiturates and benzodiazepines and GABA acts as inhibitory neurotransmitter at striatum that is a basal ganglia so next you can see here the loss of GABA is associated with loss of acetylcholine this will mainly lead to Huntington's chorea where there is hyperkinetic movement disorder and it where there are involuntary movements associated Next, let us see the GABA receptors. We have mainly A, B, C receptors. A is associated with ion channel, and B is associated with, uh, you know, our T protein couple receptor. Whereas C is associated with ion channel. So we can remember both A and C. A, C are for ion channels. Only B is special for G protein couple receptor. 
Next, we'll move on to glycine. So, glycine is found predominantly at the level of spinal cord, uh, that is Renshaw cells. And this Renshaw cells mainly release glycine and inhibit the alpha motor neurons. So, we have a substance which is a spinal poison, that is strychnine. Strychnine mainly stimulates the alpha motor neuron by inhibiting Renshaw cells and causes spastic paralysis. So, you can see Renshaw cells. Uh, mainly what they do they release glycine and inhibit alpha motor neurons but here strictness which stimulates alpha motor neuron by inhibiting Renshaw cells so here it is inhibiting Renshaw cell and it is leading to spastic paralysis and strictin is an antagonist of glycine that is it's having opposite effect to glycine because glycine is leading to inhibition of alpha motor neuron but strictin is like uh, stimulating the alpha motor neuron Next, we'll have the tetanospasmin, which mainly act at the spinal cord. And the mechanism of action is it inhibits the release of GABA and glycine. Both are inhibited, right? So it inhibits that means it causes spastic paralysis. So this is all about our neurotransmitters from our uh, revision series. Now, we also have actually some important points uh, like uh, synapses divided into two types chemical synapse electrical synapse and the chemical synapse is the most important one it's unidirectional whereas electrical synapse is usually bidirectional and uh, the neurotransmitter receptors are divided in two types inotropic and metabotropic inotropic have direct gate ion channels metabotropic have second messenger system and cause prolonged effect and second messenger especially g protein couple receptors and in chemical synapses, you know, usually vesicles are formed at the presynaptic end. Whereas in electrical synapses, directly by gap junctions, there is uh, transformation, uh, you know, information is going on. And like there are total 40 important neurotransmitters. And they are like divided into excitatory transmitter, inhibitory transmitter. Excitatory transmitter is a neurotransmitter that open especially cation channels that is positive channels whereas inhibitory transmitter is one which opens anion channels and allow negative ions to enter so that it is inhibiting the neuron. So now serotonin is also an inhibitor of pain and it is also useful to control the moods and also sleep cycle. And nitric oxide is useful for behavior and memory functions and neuropeptides are usually slow. So these are all some I found in a textbook and resting membrane potential of soma is like about minus 65 millivolts but whenever the neuron gets excited it will go into minus 45 that is it is becoming uh, and it's moving towards the positive side and inhibited neuron is like minus 70 means it's getting more negative than the uh, resting membrane potential so what is epsp epsp is a excitatory postsynaptic potential but it's a graded potential it's not the action potential uh, it is mainly because of closure of potassium channels so that potassium ions will not go outside and open of sodium and calcium channels so that positive ions are coming inside and IPSP is inhibitory postsynaptic potential it's actually also a graded potential not an action potential so here actually opening of potassium channels lead to hyperpolarization because a lot of potassium is going means a lot of positive ion is going from the cell so that negativity is increasing in the cell that is lead to hyperpolarization next fatigue of synapse like sometimes after some time the synapse will stop because it's a protective for us because if synapse is more then it will lead to higher neuro excitability and it may lead to epileptic seizures that is continuous contraction and abnormal contraction of uh, neurons so to protect that our synapse will have fatigue that it will take some time rest and in alkalosis condition that is whenever the ph is high in our body then the neuronal excitability also increases and of course again it may have the chance to scissors so whenever there is alkalosis in a body the scissors may form and acidosis means uh, low ph so neuronal activity is dropped and in especially in diabetes you can see this acidosis condition in uremic diabetes and also it may lead to coma acidosis may lead to coma next hypoxia hypoxia is low oxygen so actually low oxygen to the tissue so it will lead to inexcitability of neuron next the substances like coffee which have a chemical caffeine tea with theophyll and coca with uh, theobromine so all these chemicals are increasing the neuronal excitability and anesthetics increase the neuronal membrane threshold for excitation and they decrease the synaptic transmission so synaptic so this is important about anesthetic and synaptic delay is like 0.5 milliseconds 
and we need to know some properties like convergence divergence spatial temporal sublingual fringes what are this so convergence is nothing but multiple presynaptic neurons are attacking on the single synapse so like multiple presynaptic neurons are coming for example these are the multiple presynaptic neurons and this is only one neuron so this is convergence example you can see it in spatial summation so what is spatial summation two or more synapse are unite together to form a threshold summit together to form a threshold two or more synapses are coming and they summit together to form a threshold in the specific neuron that is called as spatial summation so convergence is seen in spatial summation next coming to divergence divergence is where one synapse connections to two or more postsynaptic neurons so for example this is one synapse this is having uh, connections with two or more postsynaptic neurons so this is divergence so this above one is convergence this is divergence and next special we have seen already temporal summation is one after the other the synap uh, the presynaptic stimuli occur so actually uh, first this will come next this will come next this will so one after other they will be coming so as they are coming this all are added together and finally they will lead to threshold in the specific type of neuron and this will lead to formation of action potential next let us see what is subliminal fringe so actually subliminal fringe is mainly seen in where two types of neurons for example this neuron uh, gives uh, two types of potentials to this and for example this is a presynaptic neuron and this is b presynaptic neuron so you can see from a presynaptic neuron one of the fiber will come and here and from b one of it will come so both will summit and it will lead to threshold here but you can see in the adjacent neuron only one side of uh, b neuron is coming as a presynaptic stimuli but not the a one so you can see only one is coming so that it is not having the actual potential to form action potential so this is called as subliminal fringe and next what is occlusion occlusion is where two adjacent neurons given stronger excitatory inputs so occlusion is where like this one this is called as occlusion because here two neurons are coming and giving a proper stimuli this is occlusion this is subliminal fringe so this is all about some important topics we need to understand in our uh, central nervous system especially this neurotransmitters and here we have completed our synapses from our guidance textbook this is all about our synapses chapter in guidance textbook and this is all about the important neurotransmitters sensory so of central nervous system physiology so now we are at sensory receptors so first we need to start with sensory physiology so it's a classification of senses mainly senses are divided into general senses also called as somatic senses and next one is special senses so what are general senses are like touch pain they're like general uh, like on any part of the body if you touch it will be related to a brain pain temperature and these receptors are located especially within the skin and they are known as somatic senses and next coming to special senses special senses are the one where the receptors are located within the skull means inside the skull the receptors are present like for vision hearing smell taste and balance so you can see this for for all this there is a skull for example for vision eyes are in the skull for hearing ear is in the skull so this receptors which are in skull are the special senses whereas the receptors which are present on the skin are the general senses or somatic senses now let us see the sensory pathway mainly the sensory pathway is an afferent pathway and it's also an ascending pathway according to the brain uh, means from the spinal cord how the signals are going to the brain that is a ascending pathway and the motor motor pathway is an efferent pathway which is coming from the spinal cord and the descending pathway that is it is coming from the cortex to the spinal cord so it is a descending pathway and next uh, we are having the somatic or general senses which mainly include the touch pain temperature and the receptors are mainly skin region so actually this is a spinothalamic pathway that is from the spinal cord the sensations are going to the thalamus of the brain especially thalamus which is present in our brain stem so you can see the pathway here first from the skin the sensations are going to the spinal cord by means of a beta fibers or a delta fibers or c fibers so this a beta fibers mainly convey the touch sensations of the skin to the spinal cord and next the a delta fibers and c fibers they convey mainly pain from the skin to the spinal cord and from the spinal cord uh, 
and also we have one more neuron that is the first order neuron which is conveying the information from the skin to the spinal cord now from the level of spinal cord the information should reach to the thalamus the thalamus which is present in the brain which is a relay station so from the spinal cord mainly we have the second order neurons which are giving this information from the spinal cord to the thalamus and here we have mainly two types of pathways that is dorsal column and we have anterolateral pathways so by these two pathways from the spinal cord information goes to thalamus and from the thalamus which is a relay station from here finally to leisure cortex that is a sensory cortex by means of third order neurons so this is a pathway this pathway is called as spinothalamic pathway that is from the spinal cord to the thalamus of the brain so this pathway is where uh, we convey the touch sensations of the skin to the brain and also we convey the pain sensations which are coming mainly from the a delta fibers and c fibers now let us move on to the classification of receptors we have different sensory receptors like according to their function for example mechanoreceptors these are mainly touch receptors and noise uh, nocio receptors which are mainly pain receptors so you can see this mechanoreceptors are the touch receptors which are nothing but a beta fibers and no receptors which are pain receptors mainly a delta fibers and c fiber and next we have thermoreceptors according to name we can understand which are mainly temperature receptors that is any temperature changes and tropio receptors are joint position receptors that is uh, you can see here proprio means position so any position changes those are going to going to proprio receptors and you have extra receptors extra in the name you can say external stimuli receptors here examples you can take mechano receptors because touch is an external stimuli and it's coming to intro receptors these are the internal changes sensors mainly osmo receptors like osmolality change inside the blood or fluids like that and it's coming to tele-receptors Teleceptors are distant stimuli sensors. These are especially photoreceptors. So light coming from far away that is like photoreceptor. So these are like distant stimuli means any sensors which are coming from for from far away. Next, let us see the properties of receptors. So mainly we have uh, M L I D. Uh, mild spelling M I L D mild. So this mild spelling should be somewhat reversed to get our mnemonic that is M L I D. So these are the functions of properties of receptors. So first one is modality. Modality. Modality is a type of stimuli. According to the type of stimuli, the receptor is. For example, nocy receptors for pain stimuli, mechano receptors for touch stimuli. So according to the type, the uh, type of stimuli, the receptors are there for them. So that is called as modality. And it's coming to location. So the most sensory receptors are located in skin and the receptive field is response area of receptor like uh, receptive field is uh, the field the receptive field which is present around surrounding the receptor so around the receptor how much of the area which is present that is called as receptive field means only when the stimulus comes to that receptive field then only the receptor can accept it so that is called as receptive field and next receptor density receptor density is mainly saying like how many number of receptors are present for example highest number of receptors are present at lips and fingertips so that they have two point discrimination like if you put two points at the same time in the lips or in the fingertips we can find out that we can discriminate that this kind of impulse is coming from this time like that because the two point discrimination here has a low distance in between them so here we can easily find it but it is low at the case of trunk and hips because here the two point discrimination distance is very much high as the distance is very much high we can't discriminate the two points especially in trunks and hips next going to the intensity the receptors mainly convey signals using action potential and that follows all or none law that is like if the you know in action potentials all or none law if the stimulus continues then it will continue if it will not happen it will not happen but it will not be half of that is all or none law so thus amplitude remains constant but the frequency changes so this is about intensity so more intense stimuli means high frequency of action potential less intense stimuli means low frequency of action potential so you can see always the amplitude is constant but the frequency changes and it's coming to duration the time interval between the starting and stop of receptor activity so if the stimulus is there the receptor starts and if the stimulus has gone away then the receptor will stop so the duration between the start of the receptor and the stop of the receptor activity is called duration so these are like all the main properties of receptors you can remember like mlid so mild smelling it's somewhat different 
L will come first that then this is a um, properties of receptors next let us see especially the touch receptors so touch receptors are especially present the location in skin region and these are the first order neurons for the touch receptors are a beta fibers these are large myelinated fibers so this a beta fibers are the one which are the first order neurons and these are mainly four in number that is two are superficial the superficial ones are called mucinous corpuscles and Markel cells both starting with m and two are deep cells that is pacinian corpuscles and roughness endings so total four receptors uh, four in number so total four in number are the touch receptors two are superficial two are deep superficial ones starting with m mucinous corpuscle Markel cells and the deep one are pacinian corpuscles and roughness ending so let us see about each corpuscle or uh, each cells in this receptors first one mucinous corpuscle so it's actually the most abundant among all these receptors of mechanoreceptors so their location is especially lips and fingertips and find out they are usually useful to find out initial contact so the function is mainly fine touch and vibration but of low frequency so you remember it find out the vibration of low frequency and it's coming to Markel cells so these are sensitive to edges and corners so you can understand this like if you are only sensitive to edges and corners so it is helpful in blind people because they mainly touch the sense uh, corners and edges to find out because as they can't see they first find out the corners edges and they'll try to uh, find out the things so this is called as braille reading system which is mainly seen in blind people and next we have uh, Paxesian corpuscle which mainly detect the pressure changes so p4p Paxesian corpuscle pressure changes and also they mainly observe the detect the vibrations of especially high frequency so you can see here the mucinous corpuscle find out the vibration of low frequency but passesian corpuscles find out the vibration of high frequency and next is the roughness endings this endings mainly detect the pressure changes especially in joint spaces and skin stretch so remember joint spaces with roughness endings and skin stretch is also having its Fun, uh, it can also can be detected by means of roughness endings so these are the different types of four receptors which are present in touch receptors so mark mucinous corpuscles markel cells pacian corpuscles roughness endings so mucinous corpuscles is most am abundant among all this present in fingertips and uh, lips and it's useful for fine touch and low frequency vibrations markel cells mainly in blind people called as braille reading system for uh, touching edges and corners and passes in corpuscle mainly p4p they detect the pressure changes and high frequency uh, vibration roughness and mainly detect the pressure especially in joint spaces and skin stretch next we'll move on to pain receptors so pain receptors are the pain stimuli is mainly conveyed from the free nerve endings of a delta fibers and c fibers so mainly we have our two fibers right a delta fibers and c fibers which mainly convey the pain to the brain so this a delta fibers and c fibers let us see the differentiation so mainly a delta fibers are myelinated whereas c fibers are unmyelinated so these are like fast pain or first pain uh, fibers whereas c fibers are slow pain second pain and this a delta fibers are sharp pricking and acute pain whereas c fibers dull diffuse chronic and burning pain and these are neospinothalamic pain new in evolution neo means new in evolution and the neurotransmitter here is glutamate but the c fibers are paleospinothalamic pain that is paleo means oldest in evolution and the neurotransmitter here especially substance p so remember about the differences about a delta fibers and c fibers let us move on to CIPS that is congenital insensitivity to pain syndrome means here the person can't get the pain whatever the pain going on but he can't get the pain because the voltage gated sodium channels are absent at the free nerve endings because the free nerve endings are the what which are going to give the pain so as the free nerve endings sodium channels are absent voltage gated sodium channels are absent so the person can't get the pain this is called as SIPS that is congenital insensitivity to pain syndrome next let us see hyperalgesia so it's nothing but increased pain perception mainly due to algogens algogens are the one which are pain producing chemicals so mainly occur due to sensitization of free nerve endings and due to various chemicals like algogens and this algogens are pain producing chemicals especially in our body we have prostaglandins histamine substance p serotonin bradykinin these are all the substances chemicals in our body which are present 
endogenously these are all the pain producing chemicals among all this the bradykinin is the most potent pain producer so the most powerful pain producing chemical is bradykinin and mainly due to decrease interstitial for fine uh, nerve endings and increase the pain this process is called sensitization and next we have allodynia allodynia is a painful stage induced by simple touch so just by touch only some people will get intense pain that is called as allodynia next let us see analgesia so analgesia is nothing but decrease in pain per perception it is most potent analgesic is morphine morphine is an opioid so but not only uh, we no need to give extra genus with this morphine drug also inside our body we have some endogenous morphine like substances which are mainly produced by analgesic system in peri <coughs> aqueductal gray matter so this are those are like endorphins dynorphins and encephalin so these are the one which reduce the pain so these are endogenous analgesic system so this uh, acupuncture acupuncture procedure is the one where they prick the needle into the skin but because of pricking the needle into the skin this mor morphine like endogenous opioids are formed so that the pain is decreased in the body and the stress induced analgesia is seen in injured soldiers at battlefield it occurs mainly due to cannabinoids like endogenous cannabinoids also known as anandamide so you can see here like stress induced analgesia in stress also the pain will be decreased especially you can see in the battlefield the soldiers they continuously uh, participate in this battlefield but their pain is decreased mainly because of cannabinoids which are produced endogenously in the body itself those are called as anandamide and next let us see the gate control theory of pain that states that the touch inhibits pain so that's why we use massaging technique so massage technique is where just by touching peripherally the pain is inhibited inside the body so this mechanism of action is mainly based on tense so tense is nothing but the cutaneous trans transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation of a beta fibers so whenever we do massaging we are mainly stimulating the a beta fibers this a beta fibers at the one we already discuss about a beta fibers which conveys the touch sensation so because of this touch sensation the pain inside the body is getting decreasing so this is a technique of massaging that is also called as gate control theory of pain and this gate control theory of pain here we have this <coughs> a beta fibers are inhibitory neuron so they inhibit the projection neuron and thereby inhibiting the pain pain so this is a uh, especially seen in substantia gelatinosa of brain region so because of this the pain is inhibited and the acupuncture is endogenous analgesic system it is a mechanoreceptor and sorry till here on so endogenous analgesic system is acupuncture so endogenous means endogenous only like opioids like endorphin dynorphin and encephalin are releasing so because of this the pain in the body is decreased naturally without giving any outside drugs like morphine like opioids and next let us see thermoreceptors <laughs> we have cold detecting receptors and warm detecting receptors but the cold rece detecting receptors are 10 times more in number when compared with warm receptors and they detect the temperature between 10 to 24 degrees and they mainly act by a special a delta fibers and c fibers via trpm trpm is a transient receptor potential menthol channels so menthol is used for cool sensation so even in uh, marketing purposes we use menthol to produce cool in Uh, that substances so this channels are also called as transient receptor potential menthol channels and next coming to warm detecting receptors these are less in number than cold receptors and they detect the temperature between 30 to 45 degrees and they act by special c fibers via trpv trpv is a transient receptor potential veniloid so what is veniloid veniloid is when if we eat any uh, red chili by mistake if we eat red chili then capsicoid capsicoid is a chemical present in red chili that releases out and activates this veniloid so because of this there is some uh, pain like condition so this channel is called transient receptor potential veniloid channel and trpv3 channel which detects the body temperature normal body temperature that is 37 degrees so whenever we we'll say the temperature as pain like cold pain warm pain 
cold pain is the one if the temperature is less than 5 degrees celsius that is cold pain and warm pain is that when the temperature is greater than 45 degrees or 45 degrees that is warm pain means this is a condition where the temperature is not felt as temperature but as pain that if the temperature is very low like less than 5 degrees then it is pain and if temperature is very high like 45 degrees or above it, it is pain now let us see what is the significance of adaptation so mainly we have rars and sars so rars are rars are the rapidly adapting receptor this rapidly adapting receptor is also called as phasic receptor it mainly responds to only first stimulus example mesnes corpuscle pcsn corpuscle so these are only res uh, responding to the first stimulus so these are called as rapidly adapting receptor or phasic receptor and next we have slowly adapting receptor or tonic receptor they mainly respond to the first stimulus as well as even to the another stimulus after short interval so you can see this rapidly adapting receptor only responding to one stimulus but here they are re responding to one stimulus and later may also respond to another stimulus in a short interval so example we have here merkel cells roughness endings and free nerve endings so here the modality of sensation is sorry that's it so rars are and we seen in mesnes corpuscles pcsn corpuscles both are seen in corpuscles whereas sars there is slowly adapting receptors or tonic receptors seen in merkel cells roughness endings and free nerve endings so this is all about complete revision of sensory receptors next we'll move on to somatosensory pathways now we are at somatosensory pathways let us continue our revision series on central nervous system physiology so now let us check out the introduction to somatosensory pathways so mainly we will have two pathways here today we are going to discuss about the dorsal column pathway and the anterior lateral pathway so let us check out each of them one by one so first we need to have a basic outline like first the receptor is the skin so for example if you touch the skin then that information is going to the spinal cord that means of first order neurons later from the spinal cord to the thalamus the information is going by second order neurons and finally from the thalamus to the sensory cortex so the sensory cortex is the highest part of uh, higher brain center so where finally that i have touched the skin so this information will go finally up to the sensory cortex so this is a basic outline of uh, today understanding so this uh, pathway this is a general pathway it has two pathways like dorsal column pathway anterior lateral pathway let us see its differences and understand them so the spinal uh, thalamic pathways is called as spinothalamic because from the spinal cord the information is going to the thalamus right and also let us see what is brown sequence syndrome all of this so the spinothalamic pathways are mainly divided into dorsal column pathway and the anterior lateral pathway so first one is the dorsal column pathway so here we have mainly more myelinated fibers means fast conduction right more myelination means very fast conduction and the sensations conducted are especially proprioception that is like joint position sense so like uh, how is your joint position now if you think about your joint position immediately you can say that my legs are now folded or my hands are like uh, catching pen so this proprioception you have got just now it's very fast mainly because of our dorsal column pattern and even the fine touch vibrations and uh, stere stereognosis stereognosis means even if you close your eyes you can say where your leg is now and you can say where is your hand is now so like you can locate your body parts even if your visual like your visual effect is gone so that is stereognosis so all this are mainly maintained by a dorsal column pathway and very fast pathway so immediately you can get the response here and here actually the pathway is ipsilateral in the spinal cord but later it crosses over at the level of medulla so what is ipsilateral let us check out so this is the dorsal column pathway you can see in the spinal this is a spinal cord in the spinal cord if it is starting from the left half then it will be in the left half only later it will turn its track in the medulla it will turn to the opposite side i will show that diagram later first you understand this and next we will move on to the anterior lateral pathway so actually more here we have unmyelinated fibers so then only you can understand it's somewhat slow pathway so it's slow conduction and the sensations here are like the sensations which are going slow to the brain like pain so that's why you think uh, when you get pain it will be for a longer time because it's slowly going to the brain and slowly so that's what the pain is for a longer time and even the temperature like if you feel cold you will feel for a lot of time and if you feel hot so all this and crude touch not fine touch you can see here it's fine touch that's why it's going very fast but crude touch is going very slow these are all the anterior lateral pathway 
and its contralateral and spinal cord that is you can see here this is a anterolateral pathway as it is coming in the spinal cord only it's changing its track it's going to the opposite side but the dorsal column pathway doesn't change in the spinal cord it's it's later in the spinal cord but later in the medulla it crosses over but anterolateral from the beginning it's contralateral now let us see what is brown sequoid syndrome actually it's a hemi section of spinal cord that is half side of the spinal cord is cut so for example uh, ipsilateral loss of proprioception means the same side ipsilateral means is the same side for example now we have done the hemi section on the left side then on the left side only there will be loss of proprioception uh, that is loss of position sensation on the same side and also loss of vibration on the same side so this is mainly seen in dorsal column on the same side because you know in the spinal cord it's like ipsilateral side and next coming to contralateral loss of pain and temperature contralateral means opposite side now as the injury is in the left side then the loss will be on the right side so right side there is loss of pain and temperature so it's an anterolateral pathway on the opposite side so this is what you need to understand if it is a dorsal column it's ipsilateral so at the same uh, side where the injury has happened at the same side there will be loss of proprioception and vibration but in the anterolateral pathway there will be loss of pain and temperature on the opposite side now let's check out this dorsal column pathway and anterolateral pathway by means of diagram to understand it properly so mainly this dorsal column pathway have two types of nucleus that is tractus cuneatus and tractus gracilis so this tractus cuneatus mainly carries upper limb sensation so how to remember it tractus cuneatus uatus you can see here eat we have a word eat so only with your hands you can eat right with your legs you can't eat so remember like this tractus cuneatus carries upper limb sensation whereas tractus gracilis uh, is mainly carries a lower limb sensation you can also remember like uh, gastrocnemius muscle yes in our leg right so like that also gracilis muscle is also like so like that also can remember so tractus gracilis carries a lower limb sensation now let us see the dorsal column pathway diagram and understand next we will also check out the anterolateral pathway so first let us do zoom in onto our dorsal column pathway so dorsal column pathway mainly have uh, proprioceptors and mechanoreceptors like uh, the chair you know they mainly check out the change in position and change in uh, touch receptors so this receptors give the information mainly by means of first order neuron efferent neuron and by ascending pathway you know this is a ascending pathway it is going towards the brain and this is also called spinothalamic pectorate because from the spinal cord the nerve is going into the brain so first it will reach the spinal cord and this is as it is a dorsal column pathway it will be ipsilateral means on the same side only it will be later it reaches into the medulla in the medulla you can see it is crossing it is crossing to the opposite side and as it is crossing to the opposite side here comes a second order neuron this gives uh, information to the thalamus from the thalamus finally by means of third order neuron it goes into the primary somatosensory cortex so you know actually we have two uh, somatosensory cortex the primary and secondary but the primary is most extensive and it's most common hence whenever we say somatosensory cortex we mainly talk about the primary somatosensory cortex next let us move on to the anterolateral pathway so here at is at, at the beginning of spinal cord only the nerve is contralateral so let us see mainly we have nociceptors and thermoreceptors you know nociceptors we see the change in pressure and um, thermoreceptors we see the change in temperature so mainly by means of first order efferent neuron you can see in the beginning in the spinal cord only it's crossing towards the opposite side and now it is moving to this uh, by means of second order neuron into the thalamus next third order neuron and finally reaching the primary somatosensory cortex so this is the dorsal column pathway and the anterolateral pathway now we will check out the thalamus so thalamus is mainly considered as relay station because you can see you now in the dorsal column pathway or either in our uh, anterior lateral pathway finally the second order neurons are going to the relay station and here the majority of sensory neurons relay in the thalamus and the third order neurons the neurons from the thalamus to the sensory cortex yeah of course the second order neurons will be coming from the spinal cord to the thalamus and the third order neurons uh, are going from the thalamus to the primary sensory cortex so touch pain temperature these are all processed by the ventro posterior lateral nucleus very important ventro posterior lateral nucleus which is present in the thalamus so in the thalamus we have a nucleus in a short form vpl that is ventro ventro posterior lateral nucleus which mainly senses the touch pain and temperature next we have a third order neuron which emerges from the vpl nucleus and go to the sensory cortex and the thalamic 
pain syndrome what is this thalamic pain syndrome it's uh, if artery supplying the vpl undergoes infarction during any stroke the patient has excruciating pain why because vpl nucleus is the one which uh, process the pain temperature right and touch so if any stroke means any infarction of this artery which is you know supplying the vpl then it will also irritate this pain so that there will be pain and this is also called as degeny rossi syndrome because it was found by the scientists so degeny rossi syndrome so this is very important vpl is a main focus in a thalamus now let us move on to sensory cortex so sensory cortex is a higher center where the cortex uh, is mainly divided into parietal cortex and frontal cortex in middle we have a central sulcus this central sulcus uh, before the central sulcus we will call precentral or frontal cortex which is especially a motor cortex and the post central or the parietal cortex is a sensory cortex the broadman areas are mainly three one two actually what these are broadman areas these are the neurological numbers which are given to specific areas of brain so especially the sensory cortex is present in the broadman area of three one and two and let us see the localization so exclusively it is done by our sensory cortex so localization is mainly by our sensory cortex in the sensory homunculus what is sensory homunculus this diagram you can see this is sensory homunculus actually it is a representation of all body parts in the brain like you can know in a, in our brain every part of our body has some kind of position so that that was first plotted by penfield homunculus and it is located mainly in the parietal cortex you can see this is the parietal cortex and the vertical arrangement of body parts here you can see mainly the vertical arrangement of body parts so in the top you will see the legs yes in the top the legs in the bottom you have seen the face and uh, most lateral one lateral means this side the most lateral one we have the face and the most medial one will have the foot or the leg right most medial one is the leg and uh, the representation is mainly based on usage of body parts so you can see here the maximum representation is done for lips and thumbs because they are like somewhat swollen you can see the thumb is swollen and you can see the half lip is given but it's given somewhat in enlarged fashion so the lips and thumbs represent that the maximum representation in this diagram and the minimum representation in this diagram is given for trunk and tip, hips i actually can't see them only you can see like very small trunk and hips here they are so that very small minimum representation and one more thing is there is no visceral organ representation here like liver heart you can't find those names only see only all normal body parts are present but the visceral body parts are not present so visceral pain is always a referred pain referred pain is for example if you get heart pain then you will say uh, it is moving to some other uh, side of it. body or some other organ so that is the referred pain that is not the exact pain so visceral pain is always referred pain now let us see some of the loss in sensory physiology so mainly we have four loss that is miller's dog time bell magenti law law of projection cortical plasticity and webner fechner law so let us see one by one the first law is miller's dog time so of specific now energies it's a specific receptors identify only specific sensation so what it says is for every specific sensation we have one specific receptor so for example mesnes corsepel detect only touch right and photoreceptors detect only light so what it means is for every specific sensation we have one specific receptor that is a muller's doctrine and next we have bell magenta's law so this is mainly seen in spinal cord that is we have dorsal roots which are mainly sensory and ventral roots are mainly motor so this is a basic uh, knowledge of spinal cord everyone knows so this is that law which has given this is bell magenta law next let us move on to law of projection so the cortex always projects to the lowermost receptor location irrespective of site of stimulation so cortex always projects to lowermost receptor location and irrespective of site of stimulation it explains phantom pain in amputated limbs so actually what is this law of projection is amputated limbs means if we cut off the limbs even if we cut off the limbs the patient can feel that the pain in that kind of limb even though limb, the limb is not present but the pain is present that is called as law of projection so this cortex always projects to lowermost receptor location irrespective of site of stimulation now let us see the cortical plasticity so nearby areas encroach the limb region also explains phantom pain in amputated limbs here also the same thing that here what it says is in amputated region means if we cut off some part of limb then the pain may be in the nearby region of that cut off area that is cortical plasticity and next let us see webner fechner law 
सो इट्स अ मैग्नीट्यूड ऑफ सेंसेशन विच इज फेल्ड डायरेक्टली प्रोपोर्शनल टू द लॉगर लॉगरेथमिक इंक्रीज दैट इज टेन टाइम्स इंक्रीज इन इंटेंसिटी ऑफ इनिशियल स्टिमस सो वॉट दिस वेबन ऑफ फेशनल लॉसेस इज फॉर एग्जाम्पल इफ यू हैड इन आर हैंड सम हंड्रेड ग्राम्स ऑफ फूड एंड ऑन दैट इफ यू हैड ओनली वन ग्राम देन वी मे नॉट सेंस दैट चेंज बट टू दैट हंड्रेड ग्राम इफ यू हैड थाउजेंड ग्राम्स लाइक टेन टाइम्स इंक्रीज दैन ओनली यू कैन फील दैट चेंज इन अ वेट ऑफ अ that particular substance so that is nothing but the magnitude of sensation felt is directly proportional to logarithmic increase that to 10 times increase in intensity of initial stimulus and next we have anterior lateral chordotomy relieving pain in right leg is effective because it entraps left anterior lateral spinothalamic pathway so what it says is कॉडोटमी रिलीविंग पेन सो एक्चुअली वी डू कॉडक्ट कॉडोटमी एक्सपेशली इन थोरासिक रीजन टू रिलीव पेन बिकॉज द पेन फाइबर्स विच आर गोइंग दैट मे बी कट ऑफ बट दिस विल बी ओनली फॉर अ फ्यू डेज इन द राइट लेग दे आर सेंग इन द राइट लेग नाउ वी आर डूइंग दिस प्रोसेस सो इफ यू डू इन द राइट लेग इट मेनली इंटरप्ट द लेफ्ट एंड रोलेट स्पाइनोथर्मिक ट्रैक बिकॉज यू नो द पार्ट विच इज एफेक्टेड विल बी ऑलवेज ऑपोजिट टू इट बिकॉज ऑफ कॉन्ट्रालेटरल पाथवेज आइदर इन a dorsal column pathway or either in anterolateral pathway but the dorsal lateral pathway is ipsilateral in the spinal cord and the anterolateral pathway is contralateral in the spinal cord itself so this is all about our uh, complete revision of this chapter that is somatosensory pathways and next we'll move on to our different chapters especially next we'll move on to our special senses